this sucks. With bear season here, my priority has been hunting. <laughs> so yeah. first, first podcast I recorded in probably two months. So oh, yeah, cool. Well, I see you got uh, you filled a tag. Yeah, it was uh, it was bittersweet. We'll put it that way. I yeah. don't know if you followed followed some of the shenanigans along the way, but uh, apparently I need to go back to the shooting range more often. So <laughs> that happens, man. You know, yeah. you know, you can. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've. I've practiced at the range for like goat and sheep hunts at 500 yards and then do that all summer. And then, you know, you get a nice goat. I remember I got a goat at 402 yards and then I missed a deer at like 50. <laughs> You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. Mine was, uh, just stupid mistakes. Like, you know, I, my scope bases were loose and I caught it at my house and then, uh, tightened them back down and I have it on a mil spec rail. So I just tightened it down and I figured it just went back right into place. Yeah. Well, it didn't. And I went up to go shoot my gun at a spot where he, where he had already, we had already killed a bear and, uh, there's a giant freaking bear there again. I'm like, well, if I just get close enough, it'll probably be good. And so I, I was wrong. I was like three feet to the left. It was like, oh, yeah. thank God it was a clean miss. Yeah. Especially on yeah. a bear, man. Those fucking bears are tough. And it's like, if you don't yeah. get a, if you don't get a good vital or, I mean, you know, a lot of times the bear is going to die, but it's just, if you don't get a good vital, you're just tracking that bear for days. I've tracked bears for a week. Really? Yeah. And then I found them and obviously, you know, they're scavenged and, but it's just, you know, uh, yeah. Well, I shot me. one, um, after I sighted in the gun, I missed that big bear with, I found a one that everybody knew about locally, but no one's really been able to put eyes on them. <clears throat> and, you know, just the soup can sized turd kind of yeah, bear. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was just driving home and and just needed to get out of the house because I'd been cooped up with a sinus infection. So I just went on a drive, came, was coming off the mountain around seven and uh, looked over. I was like, holy fuck, that's a giant bear. So I was like, well, that's totally inside my range. I had my six, five and I was using some bullets that some buddies gave me and um, never shot anything with them except just targets, but they pound like su yeah. such an accurate bullet. And it was a Sierra match King with six, five. And uh, so I get within four 30 of it. And um, I was hoping to take out his shoulders. Well, I haven't shot a bear that far away with my six, five, and I didn't have enough oomph to do that. I just, broke the front shoulder and didn't go any farther. So my buddy found it like five days later feeding, um, in a unit. And so he shot it, wounded it. So that bear, cause I shot it twice. Cause I shot it again on the run, um, just to put another bullet in it. And, uh, so that bear has been shot three times and it's still going. We don't, I don't think, cause I know the bullet he shot hit the back leg. It was just a horrible shot. And, uh, Yeah he tracked it and the bear just started going up the other Canyon. I was like, man, that's, that's one pissed off tough bear. Cause I guarantee you, he's probably going to live through all that crap unless infection gets them. Cause none of them were fatal hits. Yeah. They're, so. they're just, they're amazing animals. I hit a bear once with a 308 and I hit him back. I wasn't exactly sure what I hit him, but from the bone that I picked out of the tree, it looked like rib. But it could have been maybe it was back a little further and it might have been shit. I don't hmm. know. Me and I, I went over and Mike, I had another guy that was in uh, up with us and I was showing him after. And he's like, yeah, that looks like rib, but maybe it's a shin bone. But anyway, so I blew. There wasn't a lot of blood, but there was like meat and bone fragments on the branch behind him. Holy crap. That, that bear took off. Hmm. So I chased. I went after the bear, you know, slowly went down this crevice. Found him on the opposite side. He crossed a creek and went up and he climbed a tree and I could hear him up climbing a tree. So I got back up. I went around and tried to get on top of him. And he's sitting up in a tree and it was just getting dark and I was going down to get a shot. And he fell out of the tree, probably 70 feet, slid all the way to the bottom. And I was like, okay, man, this bear's toast. He's got to be done. So I let, let the night fall, went back the next morning. I searched that place all day. Nothing. Hmm nothing just up and left it's crazy that's tough 
That's, yeah. that's frustrating, man. What, yeah, and that was with a 308? Yeah, that was a 308. I love and, that, man. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good round. And uh, yeah, and it's funny. You could see the skid mark from where the bear hit the tree and like busted all the branches on the way down. And just like, it was like a, sl- a rock slid down that. It was a steep bank too. And that sucker, I couldn't find him. I turned that place upside down all day. Couldn't find him. No blood, no nothing. Yeah. A little bit of blood on the bottom of the tree. There's, you know, every year I, I tell people bears are probably the number one most lost animal that I, that I've ever, you know, everybody loses them. Everybody. Yeah. I mean, if you hunt them long enough, you will. And, uh, I, we lost one last night even, and, uh, watching the footage, she barely nicked it. And then, uh, there's a set, a follow-up shot and I don't know where she hit it or even if she did hit it, but we hiked down there anyways to make sure. And no, we, you know, I, I, it was so thick. I couldn't even get to where it was. I mean, it was literally a wall of i don't know how thick it is up there but it's just a wall of manzanita like bushes and rhododendrons and it was mm-hmm. like you could not walk through it it was the bear was even having a hard time getting around i mean it was insane so we ended up i got like 10 ticks on me last night two of them got in me um little bastards but uh shit happens <laughs> you know it's, yeah. but you just gotta do the best you can um and take take the best shot you can and and uh yeah yeah it's it's funny i've actually had more lost bears with my rifle than i have with my bow Hmm. yeah what do you think that is i don't you know i think it's just when i'm shooting my bow i'm getting a lot closer and i'm a lot more methodical on where my shot placement's going to be and i just i think when it's usually like i well you're in uh oregon right right yeah. And so like Oregon is probably sort of similar to BC, I think. Um, but like, it's just thick bush up here. And the way I hunt them is, um, you know, most of the shots I get, it's a little tighter, say 50, 60 yards, um, just real thick stuff. So I'm just not as careful, I think, with it with, as I am with a bow, you know, with, mm. with a bow, I'm taking my time a lot more and I'm playing the calling game a lot more. Just everything just seems a lot more methodical when I'm using a bow. That makes sense. That makes sense. Cause we're, you know, we're taking everybody I know over here has like a thousand yard gun, you know, very few of them can actually shoot that far, but uh, <clears throat> you know, the bear we lost last night was 600 and that's a pretty good Pope. Um, oh, yeah. You know, for the gun I had though, I, you know, I, I shot it the day, a couple of days before that. And I hit like a baseball at 600 yards. It was just pounding, wow. you know, just, and then, so I dialed it and everything and was coaching her through the shot. And, and, um, I, I saw one thing that concerned me, but I thought she was using the pack to hold the butt of the gun up better. It right. turns out she was pushing the butt of the gun up with her hand, oh, but gotcha. sent the round low, uh-huh. I think, I think, but, uh, so she shot like a foot low and that gun was dialed perfectly. I double, triple checked, you know, we had all day long, uh-huh. had her dry fire on it twice and, you know, I, I take responsibility for it because I should have just said, you know, let's get you off the ground, re-engage the gun, put the pack under the gun and just do it right. And yeah. uh, I just I thought it looked close enough. And I I, I I had a feeling I had a feeling I should have just followed my gut on that. But that's, you know, I won't make that mistake next time. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know, it's just like you said, shit happens for sure. So maybe what we'll uh, do, Garrett, maybe you could just uh, tell the Canadian listeners here a little bit about yourself and who you are before we get yeah. too deep into the uh, bear conversation, which I kind of would like to fall back on. Yeah, it's cool. So um, Garrett Weaver uh, from Roseburg, Oregon, and growing up here, lived here my whole life, um, hunted. We, Oregon's blessed with a lot of species, but maybe not as many as much as BC, but we have a lot uh, here in Oregon and uh, pretty good diversity of animals. And so we get to chase them on the coast or in the high desert. Um, we've got some really high country here, um, some coastal country, super thick, like we we're just talking about, but um, started a YouTube channel, I don't know, five years ago, six years ago, and then kind of just snowballed into a podcast and then into an Instagram. And, and uh, that's basically what I do for fun now is I hunt and help people along the way and and um, really dove deep into the archery stuff for uh, a few years and um, 
just kind of had to make a, make a decision between shooting long range and shooting bows. And I, I went the bow hunting uh, route cause you, I figured I could be really good at one, but not both. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, just kind of just dove head first into that and decided to be the best bow hunter I could be. And then um, kind of falling back in love with, with long range hunting this year, but um, we'll see. That's, that's kind of where I'm at and that's, that's what I'm about. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things, like you said, it's, uh, the long range game takes, I think just as much, um, hard work and dedication as archery does. Yeah. Well, I was talking to my buddies about that. I'm like, you know, people think it's just as easy as dial point and shoot. And yeah. it's not. <laughs> no way, man. No I had way. A, like, or yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say like, I've, I've, I've got a six, five, 300 Weatherby that I use for sheep and goat hunts. And, uh, man, you know, I take pokes out at 400 yards and maybe I'll stretch it up to 500. And that for me is like, you know, if I'm hitting the paper that far, I'm happy with it, but anything beyond that, it it just, I, but I I don't put the time into it. Um, you know, I, myself, I'm dedicated to archery. I got to shoot the bow every day. Um, I just love it, but yeah, man, that long range game is it's, yeah, it takes just as much hard work. It does. We were actually talking about that the other day, me and my buddies, um, my buddy missed a bear three different times, three different occasions this year. And, um, first shot that bullet hit like a foot low. And he's like, I know I was dialed. Right. And I'm like, well, but were you on the gun? Right. Well, you know, what was going on? Do you, are you sure you ranged it proper? And, and then, um, missed it again. high, I believe. And then he missed it. I, I think again, and I don't know where he hit on that time. And then um, what was going on is that the wind was just ripping every time in the unit and he was getting up and down drafts because oh, yeah. it was right in the end of the, right in the end of the day. And um, that one time it pushed his bullet low. We think the next time it pushed his bullet high and then he got farther down into the unit and took a bigger gun and uh, he took a rum 300 rum in there. <laughs> and uh, cause he was using a seven and um, that I think the second time he had an opportunity at it with the rum. He, he ended up shooting it, making a good shot and killing it. But, um, it's not as easy as it looks and it takes a lot of practice. I mean, yeah. and people I think are practicing on animals way too much. Honestly, they go to the range a couple times, get their dope, but they don't shoot in the wind. They don't mm-hmm. understand how everything else is going to affect it. And they just assume it's, it's dead if it's in their crosshairs and they dialed correctly. I think that's, there's a lot of assumptions you're making there. Yeah. And, uh, with the bow, I think it's actually, for me, I think it's easier <laughs> with the bow, you know, yeah. I, but I shoot a lot with my bow mm-hmm. and, um, the, the guessing game's just not really there. Like it is with the, with the rifle for long range for me still. So, but you know, I'm not as good with a rifle as I am with a bow. Yeah. It's, uh, like you said, there's so many variables. I mean, there's a lot of variables in archery too, but like, you know, for me, mostly the, you know, realistically the shot most shots i take on an animal are 30 to 60 yards 60 be in the high end and there's not a you know if you're if you're dialed in if um you've practicing every day and you know you're dedicated to it and you know your bow's tuned good your arrows are good you're confident and um you know there's nearly not a lot can go wrong up to you know 30 40 yards with a bow mm-hmm. i mean obviously there's always stuff that can go wrong but i just look at those shots those guys take, you know, eight, 900 yards on an animal. And there's so much that can go wrong. I mean, elevation alone mm-hmm. is huge. It's huge yeah. on what that bullet's going to do. Yeah. I was just talking to a buddy about that too. Cause I was like, I was getting some weird groups going on out of some factory ammo and I was chronoing each shot and I'm like a hundred, 150 feet per second difference. And then he's telling me, you know, that's this much of an impact change at a thousand yards. And I'm like, Holy crap. Like, you have to have the same powder charge, same speed to be accurate out to a thousand. You just can't take a box of factory ammo. You can be accurate, but you're basically rolling the dice on if that bullet's going the same speed as the previous bullet, or if you have this lot of bullet versus this lots of bullet. And it just, I don't know. I'm, I'm learning a lot all yeah. over again. And it's, 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 I wish, I wish I had more time, but um yeah, it's it's frustrating. So I, I'm probably going the hand loading route here very soon because <laughs> I'm tired yeah. of that 150 feet per second difference between between shots. You can't shoot very far when you got that difference. No, no. My dad, uh, he does all my hand loading for that six five three hundred um, that I use on those on those hunts. But um, 
yeah, it's, you know, it's, I was shooting those factory loads for that gun. And yeah, we were shooting, I was shooting at the range. I had it zeroed into 200. Everything was great. And on a box, one box of shells were great. Next box, something totally <laughs> different. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't figure it out. And I thought it was me. thought it was my scope, put it back, check all the levels, everything. And then I was talking to one of the, one of the staff down at the range and he's like, uh, you know, it could be, do you hand load or is it factory? And I said, Oh, these are all factory. And he's like, well, <laughs> yeah. you know, it could be, there could be something funny going on with the factory loads. And I'm like, Oh, for fuck's sakes, don't tell me yeah. that. I'm like, so now what? Like every box of shells, I'm going to have to recite this gun in like potentially. Yeah. It sucks. It's frustrating. I, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's just the name of the game. And so I, I'm right there with you, man. I, I'm sharing your frustrations because I was dealing with that shit three weeks ago. And I was like, man, I was just I was calling up my buddy who's deep into the long range stuff. And he's like, well, what lot are you shooting out of each box? Are they the same lot? And that was the first question he asked. I was like, yeah. no, they're not. I'm only picking up one or two boxes at a time because we can't find it around here. Yeah. And uh, so I just literally I posted a picture on Instagram. I I got I ordered five boxes of 308 and um, I still haven't checked to see if they're the same lot, but I'm crossing my fingers they all came from the same lot but it's like you pretty much have to order 200 rounds at a time and pray to god they're at the same lot just hopefully get the same consistency and then you're still dealing with different speeds Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah that's what i i ended up doing with that with my 308 i don't shoot my 308 nearly as much as i used to and uh, i don't know if i'm going to shoot it this year but i bought a a crate of shells and i was just basically (laughs) random picking a bullet out of each box throwing it in there just to make sure. But I mean, with the 308, I'm fairly confident with the 308 because it, it's zeroed in at 100 yards. And I never plan on taking those long pokes mm-hmm. like I do with uh, with with that 65 300. But uh, yeah, That's it's, it's funny. Yeah, the uh, it's the, the funny thing is, though, like I only went my dad was hand loading for me. And then the only reason I went back to factories because I was on a uh, I had a goat draw and everything was good at the range. His bullets like everything he he dials everything in, you know, micro weighs everything. Everything was good. I get out, we get, I get out on the hunt and I go to load some rounds. And when I'm on the trailhead and something happened and he didn't press the bullets far enough into the shell. Oh, so they're getting stuck in the, they're getting stuck in the magazine before they went into the chamber. And I was like, what the, so I had to take them out. And I had to sit there Single and- hand load or, yeah, I had to cut the tips off so they'd fit oh. them off. <laughs> I just whittled them down a bit with my knife. <laughs> I mean, it worked. You got a goat and an elk on that trip, but it was still, it was, it was pretty funny. And so then I, after that, I was like, oh man, you're losing it, Pops. So I went to factory and then I, then now he's hand loading again for me. And he's like, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll measure each one from now on. There you go. <laughs> Gives them something to do. Yeah, man. So, uh, Dude, I've really been enjoying your podcast lately. I've been hitting it hard. Um, it's funny. I, I got Greg. Uh, I've been chatting with Greg Poole, and he's going to come on the show. And it's funny. Oh, yeah. Um, that's kind of how I got I got diving into yours. And because like kind of, you know, well, what I do anyway with the podcast, I kind of, you know, see, find these cool guests and, you know, whatever they're whatever kind of topics I'm kind of swinging towards. And then I'll, you know, just search out podcasts that's, that they've been on and that's how I kind of, you know, started diving into yours and yeah, some great material on there, man. Good work. Thanks. I, I, uh, well, I, I do appreciate that. I, I kind of try to get a bunch of different perspectives and I mm-hmm. want the audience to build their own opinion. You know, like I don't want to tell people what to think. I want to tell them, you know, how, uh, how to come to a decision or, or just basically let them figure it out. I want to, I want to get light arrow guys, heavy arrow guys, mm-hmm. and I want to, I want to hear it all. Because if you're if your setup's the best, you should be able to de- to defend that setup yeah, yeah. and answer some solid questions about it. So, um, I've had guests on that I totally don't agree with, but I'm willing to at least have that conversation, and mm-hmm. I don't interject my opinion in there. I, want, I really want I'm really looking for different perspectives. So yeah, I I uh, haven't done any super nerdy, geeky, in the weeds bow podcasts in a while, and I th- I think my my audience is a little pissed, but. Uh, you know, I, I probably need to come out with a geeky episode again, but, um, at that, at the point when I started, there wasn't very many podcasts going that far into the weeds. I think knock on was really about, right, yeah. about it. 
um, and to the level that we were getting into the weeds and, and stuff. And so, um, like I know that you had Chris Dunlap on yeah, and, uh, and he, he's a really good guy. Um, actually a friend of mine, I actually just took his kid out bear hunting a couple weekends ago nice. and, um, you know, learn stuff from that guy and a bunch of other guys locally. And it's just a really cool community. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's a, I really appreciate that compliment. So yeah, bang on. I love it. So what, uh, what kind of arrow setup you running? You go, you heavy light. Um, I'm happy medium. Yeah. So, uh, and after doing lots of interviews and talking to tons of guys, um, just seems like the most of the guys that I really, really respect that are, you know, have insane amount of success under their belts that are killers. They're all happy medium. They don't mm-hmm. measure their FOC. Uh, they, they just bail, build a solid arrow and yeah. everything, everything's there. Just build a good arrow. Yeah. And I've got other friends that, that pretty much say that same thing. It's like, so my, my arrow build, I mean, I, I measure it because I need to know because people ask, um, but I haven't measured my FOC in three years because I've been sticking with the same arrow. Mm-hmm. It's 15%. Um, <clears throat> I'm shooting a 26 and a half inch arrow. Um, and that's not including the insert or that's not including the, uh, the, yeah, the yeah, just it's fair shot, yeah. And a half. yeah. Um, it's 478 grains. Nice. Um, and I used to have them all within half a grain tolerance. Now I'm shooting like a plus or minus three grain, four grain tolerance. So right, yeah. I'm just kind of figuring out like, where does my time really need to be spent? What really yeah. actually matters? Um, I heard from somebody through the grapevine that, Levi's, uh, Levi Morgan's arrows are, um, plus or minus like five or 10 grains. So he's like, and that guy's a better shot than I ever will be. So if plus or minus five grains for him is good enough, I mean, there's nobody else in the world that's really going to outshoot that on a bow hunting setup. So, um, I, I think that people are splitting hairs and spending time where it really doesn't matter. And, and, um, if you listen to a lot of the recent episodes, I've, I've kind of just put all that shit to the side and said, you know, we're geeking out where it doesn't matter your ass needs to be getting back into the woods and figuring out what these animals mm-hmm. are doing. Cause your FOC is not going to get you shot opportunities. Exactly. So, well, and um, that's what it comes down to. Absolutely. And, and the thing about it is balanced. Like, you know, I've been there where every shot or every time I was shooting, I was tweaking my fucking bow and it just became an obsession. And it was like, Hey man, I need to stop. I need to stop worrying about this shit. <laughs> and I need to worry about just, putting arrows on the target and getting out in the woods and just, Mm -hmm. and that's it, you know, to quit needle dick and all everything and being like, Oh, this is great. And trying everything. And like, cause every time you, every time you're changing something in your arrow, you know, you got to change your bow setup. And it's just like, and then that's time. Right. And then every every time you're doing it, you're not fully confident. And then that's just time in the bush. And it's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. And the thing is it never ends. It never ends. You could do that every day, all day, forever. And it would never end because there's always, you know, somebody's always using something else. And, you know, there's always that. What if a hundred percent, I was the guy that, and, and I've kind of rubbed off on a few of my other buddies and we kind of just passed each other because they were like woodsmanship. And now they're kind of like, we're intersecting and going opposite directions. They're going towards the gear. (laughs) And so, um, like they're always coming over and, and, um, looking at my broadhead collection and stuff. And, and you, can I try this out? Can I try that out? It's like, sure. I don't really care I, I know what i'm using so um but you know it it i used to be the guy that wanted to shoot something with a different head every year just mm-hmm. to get more experience and get more opinions about different gear right and and um you know it never really cost me um an animal but it did cost me some really really shitty track jobs that didn't have to be shitty and uh it cost me probably a little bit of accuracy not enough to make a difference hindsight but it just, it just got to the point where I was just like, I don't know. I felt like Billy Mays out there. Mm-hmm. Like this is the new product, you know? And, and it was just was like, why am I being a mouthpiece for all these companies? They don't give a fuck about me. You know, yeah. like they'll send me a free pack of broadheads and then I'm not supposed to like bend over and just do whatever they want. No, fuck that. Yeah. So I just, and, and it's kind of funny. Cause if you look at all the messages I get now, they are 180 from what I used to get, it used to be arrows, broadheads, um, what bow setup. My, the number one question is what arrow setup is good enough to kill an elk. That was like my number one question, especially after we did the giant broadhead review with the bro guys and the, and the arrow destruction, um, reviews. Um, it was, it was all arrows and broadheads. And then now it's, 
what are you doing to find these bears? What are you doing to kill these elk? What are you doing to this? What, what do I need to look for? And I'm like, those are the questions that are going to move yeah. the needle, folks. Right. So yeah. I, uh, I feel like I'm doing the right thing, going on down the right path, getting yeah. away from the gear, but, uh, and I've never been happier. I've been in the woods five times more, 10 times more yeah. than I was before doing all these YouTube videos and, and podcasts on, on gear and stuff. And, and, um, the guys that I respect or, or, you know, they've reached out to me. I'm like, dude, I like where you're at. I like where your head's at. I like what you're doing, nice. you know? And, and that's, that's what really means a lot to me. I, you know, you want to earn the respect of the guys that you respect and, and look up to. And, and, um, I just, uh, I like where I'm at now and I'm not uploading near as much as I used to, but I feel like I'm making a bigger impact. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. It's more, yeah, it's more catered. To, well, and you know, that that's exactly it. And, and that, that's kind of what I was getting to us, but I was spending way too much time worrying about all these little things that didn't really matter when you're in the bush. I mean, the thing is it's, it's gotta be consistent. You know what I mean? Like consistency right. is number one. And if you're, if you're confident in your equipment, then, you know, the rest comes up to, like you said, you know, those woodsmanship skills and, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you could, you could watch all the YouTube videos and listen to all the podcasts in the world until you actually get out and do it yourself. It ain't going to do you any fucking good. So a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And and if you don't know where the animals are at, yeah, you're never going to use all that cool money you spent on that fancy broadhead or whatever it is, or, or who knows the freaking quivalizer i make fun of that thing all the time the quivalizer you know like i've yeah. got friends that shoot that and they love it but um i, I it's just <laughs> uh it's just i don't know it's just every year it's it's a new product it's a new fad yeah. it's a new foc it's a new error weight it's 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 reinventing the wheel that's already been around for many years and just rehashing it and rebranding it in a different way to keep selling you the same shit mm -hmm. so oh yeah um it might be a different person yet telling you to do it it might be whoever, but, um, I won't throw names out there, but it's just, uh, having flirted with the, with the hunting industry, um, to the point that I have, I, I am, I am where I want to be. And I position myself far enough away to where I can give bad reviews and, and good advice. Yeah. And, and I think that's why most people follow me is because if a, if a product isn't worth its salt, or I, I say comes as advertised, uh, you're going to know, and I'm not going to back it. I'm not going to, yeah. you know, sell, carry the water for somebody, but, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know where you want to go, but that's, that's just, I wish more people had that, that mindset. I know that sounds mm -hmm. maybe a little, uh, egotistical or something, but, um, I just wish that more people had would arrive to that train of thought because they straight up, I've shot more arrows and I've done more testing on broadheads and arrows. And I've gone way down the rabbit hole more than 98% of the people ever will. And it's just like, just let me save you time. Just focus on this shit right here. You know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely, dude. And it's funny. Like I've done the same thing. I've gone down, you know, arrows, like veins, for instance, I've gone through all the different types of veins, different, you know, helical, right, left turn, done this, done yeah. that. <laughs> and now I'm back to just a typical offset blazer vein. That's you know, three yep. blazer veins. Yeah. Yeah. You know, back to where I started and it's like, fuck, I went through all that other shit and I'm right up, right back where I started. I mean, granted, I have a lot, you know, now I can say I tried it, just trial and error, error, right. but, um, yeah, it's funny. That's, that's totally true. And, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny you say Vance, cause I'm, I, I've been shooting blazers since I began bow hunting and I've switched, I've tried the AAEs, I've tried a, a, a ton of this stuff out there and veins is my, like my least tested area, but I've still shot a shit ton of them Four flat five, whatever yeah, you want to call yeah. it, a million fletch offset up and down the shaft, uh -huh. like whatever you want to talk about, we can talk about veins, but a buddy of mine, um, came out with his own vein this year. And, and if he can send me some, I'll, I'll shoot those. But, um, I, I always go back to blazers. It's I just, know. I always go back to blazers. I don't have problems with really animals flinching, um, or jump in the string or doing anything weird. And, and they may be a little bit louder than some of the veins out there, but I've never had a problem with blazers, especially in hunting situations. Like yeah. if I made a bad shot or I lost an animal, I'm not blaming the vein. Like that's yeah. a pretty chicken shit excuse in my opinion. And so it just, I don't know, man, there's a lot of better, there's a lot better things people can focus on. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. And that, yeah, like I know a lot of people say that they're loud, but I mean, I've shot animals with them dead center they didn't even know i was there so it's like well you know if i did it before and it jumped the string 
I can't really blame it on anything but me. Because right. if I was able to do it once, there's no reason I, I shouldn't have been able to do it again. I'd fuck something up along the yeah. way. And I mean, that's going to happen every time you're in the woods. Shit happens out there. Well, I mean, I've shot animals and, and I, 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 I wouldn't be surprised if people disagree with this statement. But I've shot in, um, mule deer, um, early season mule deer um, with a bow. And they're fat and lazy. They still, some of them still have velvet and, uh, you know, they're staring at me and I'm shooting them and they don't flinch and they just watch the arrow hit them. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, so where's the argument there? I don't, I don't see how that would, would, you can blame anything on If the vein was an issue, the animal literally watched me shoot it and it just stood there. It just doesn't, I don't know. I just, I don't really, it's, it's just a kind of a semantics argument. Is it the bow or the fletch or, you know, the fletchings causing, the 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 deer or whatever to jump because i've shot these deer at 90 yards out to 92 and they're watching the arrow hit them and they yeah. don't care and no. um you know obviously not a white tail but um these mill deer bucks and these black tails even they're pretty stupid and lazy late august <laughs> and they'll let for in my experience they'll they'll watch you shoot them i mean they will 100 percent just sit there chew their cud and as long as you stay inside their little outside their little bubble they'll just they, they don't they don't care it just, so I don't know what your experience has been there, but that's been mine. And, uh, yeah, after that, you know, that's why I don't care how loud my vein is. Cause I've never had an issue with it. And blazers are always picked on for, like you said, for being loud. And, and, um, it's like, well, they're quiet enough. The deer don't yeah. care. No, exactly. They are. And like, like I said, I started with blazer vans and I'm using blazer vans again, just <laughs> straight, typical, you know, so, um, but yeah, it's just a trial and error, I guess. And uh, I'm back where I've started. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to talk about bears a little bit because, uh, you Let's know, do it. it's, it's bear season. Um, you guys are allowed what? One spring bear down there? One spring bear and two fall bear. Oh, so you're allowed three. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's nice. We're only allowed two up here. We're allowed two in the spring or two in the fall. You guys have a lot of bears. I'm surprised. Yeah, we do have a lot of bears. Um, I mean, it's have- just, there's no... There's just no money involved in hunting up here. There's just nothing. So they just have no management of them. They just, it's all guessing. It's the same as the grizzly bear hunt we were talking about earlier. Yeah. I mean, there, there's absolutely no reason. There's more grizzly bears here than there is people. So really it's, well, there's a lot of grizzly bears. There's a lot of bears. Um, like BC has got to have one of the highest density population of bears in the world. I imagine. That um, sucks. I mean, that's cool because I love bears and I love bear hunting, but that sucks for all the other animals in the woods that that have to deal with the predation and, and yeah. fawn recruitment, calf recruitment. I mean, they they do. I I was talking about that the other day, and, and grizzly bears. I guess I think from one, from one, the articles I've read, you can tell me if I'm wrong or not. But grizzly bears predate more on calves and fawns, from what I've heard, than than black bears. And one of the black bear my buddy shot this year was feeding in the grass next to a fawn about 20 feet 30 feet from a fawn and had no idea it was there yeah but it's like i don't know how many of these fawns these black bears are actually eating i know it, there's a number but i don't know how significant it really is because that bear had no idea that fawn was there and if he did he would have went after it you, you would have thought anyways yeah and he was less sure. than yeah he was like 10 yards away from it so yeah uh, uh, grizzly bears for the most part like in my experience they just eat whatever the fuck they want <laughs> um wolves up here are the big one for us there's wolves do a lot of damage they they moose caribou you know they kick the shit out of those those ungulates um mm. so but we i mean we got a lot of everything right and we got a lot of predators cougars wolverines bears right you name it so um yeah you know the ungulates i mean they just have a hard time they have a hard time we got you know like especially the mule deer there's a lot of uh highway death for mule deer um, BC is growing fast. So, you know, there's a lot of road, a lot of expansion and, you know, we're a resource based country, a lot of logging and, you know, mm-hmm. that just, that that's hard on the animals too. So, um, but yeah, but back to bears, I mean, yeah, I, I love bears. I love bear hunting. Um, and it's funny, you know, I grew up on the coast, the North coast, and I never really enjoyed bear hunting and I kind of never got into it until I was down in the Southern part, which doesn't have as big and as many bears as there is up north on the coast. So, um, yeah. I feel like you guys get bigger black bear, black bears than we do in Oregon. <clears throat> well, I, I think it's all depends on where you are because, like, the bears that we get up north in northern BC and and along the coast, the north coast, they're a lot bigger than the bears we get down here. And and even the grizzly bears and brown bears, like the grizzly bears we get down in 
where I live down now, down the southeast part of the province, they're a lot smaller than the, the ones up north. That just seems like it for a lot of animals. Cause I, I was listening to, I think on like a mediator podcast a while ago and they, and, and there was a biologist saying the farther away from the equator, the bigger the animals get. Yeah. Which and that just sense. seems to go true with elk, bear, deer, everything. Yeah. Cause you guys yeah. mule deer. I'm looking at two giant freaking mule deer on the wall back there. And yeah. it's just like, man, you know, and you, and the, even the body size of your guys' deer big, is bigger yeah. than ours. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, right. I mean, right. if you kill a bit, a buck, a 200 pound buck where we're from, that's a freaking giant. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And see the bucks, we, that's one thing about our mule deer. They have big, big bodies. And, and that, you know, that makes sense, right? Because, you know, you think about the moose, like you go up to Northern BC in the Yukon and Alaska, size of the moose up there are the size of vehicles, right? And down here, we, you know, they're not nearly as big as they are up there. Hmm. Um, there was a guy, um, one of my hunting partners showed me a photo of a local bear that was killed and it was hanging on a scale and it was gutted and skinned. Um, everything else was on it. It was it, 475. Yeah. And it was the biggest, one of the biggest bears I've ever seen weighed locally. Like the, it's actually the biggest bear I've ever seen weighed locally. Wow. Never yeah. seen a bigger one, but it, so it was, it was probably like a 400 or 530 pound. I don't know, however long, much the hide weighs, right. That's yeah. all it was missing in the guts. And uh, I don't know how big that bear was, but it was for sure over 500 pounds. And oh, it's yeah. like, I've never seen a bear. I think the biggest bear I've ever seen, just judging it with my eyes was he was over 400. Um, but I, I don't know how much over 400 cause I've never seen a, any bears over 400 pounds, but I know that one was. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Plenty of 300. Was, like the brown bears on the coast, man, you get, a, you get mixed in with those brown bears. I mean, they get, you know, 800 pounds plus up there. Right. And he's, you know, I remember we'd be fishing in like the Skeena river and you'd see the bears on the side of the, side of the uh, river just pulling fish and rooting through the you know just trying to get they the fish kind of go off into the easy areas where it's, so they run up the river and then they kind of just take a break and they go in these little coolies and the bears the, they'd go in there and they'd hammer on them so but i mean hmm. they're they're big bears so and it, that's one thing like when i moved down to the southern part i was like oh they're not quite as big as they are up you know from back home so hmm. but i mean a bear's a bear. I mean, like a, a 300 pound black bear is going to fuck you up if it gets a hold of you. So <laughs> an 80 pounder will. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly, man. Yeah. 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 It doesn't take much. I mean, they're just designed a little, they're, well, they're, they're strong. They're, yeah. Super strong. And you think how tough they are. It goes back to that conversation we had earlier, just like retrieval. And man, they're, they're beasts. Everyone talks about, you know, elk being so strong and deer and stuff, but like a bear. I don't think in North America, I and granted I have no experience with moose, but I think bears would be the toughest animal for hunters to, to retrieve. And oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just, yeah. I mean, I know of, a, I know of, I know of, I don't even want to put this out in the universe, but I know of eight or 10 bears that were lost this year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it happens, man. I've lost yeah. bears, you know, like I've, I've had shots that I thought were good on bears. And, you know, I, like there's blood and there's, you know, parts of its inside laying on the blood trail. And some of those, you know, that this is one bear and I tracked that thing for three days and I found it. And, um, you know, it was a long way from where I shot it. And a lot of bears I've shot and I've never found. Him. Have you ever um, messed around with mechanicals on bears at all? Yeah, I have. I've heard a lot of guys are doing that. And I'm just like, man, like if I can get a fixed blade to fly um just that i mean outside of having a bigger cutting diameter it just doesn't i don't know why i would go away from a fixed blade but i've heard a lot of guys that are pretty experienced bear hunters they do use mechanicals on them and i'm like well you know what's your what's your take on that and what was your success so what i started using last year um last fall i made the commitment to go all bow and i started using the mechanical broadhead full time the expandable i started using the, the uh tripan the rage okay yep i've shot stuff with that yeah and it you know and i was like humming and hawing i was gonna go back to a fix and i was like you know what it's just working so i'm just gonna keep using it and i got a bear with that it went right i shot center center right through the bear only went 30 yards hmm. clean pass through yeah big cut the thing is the cut the cut diameter on those those broadheads yeah it blows my mind I shot a mule deer this year 
and I, it was kind of quartering on me and I shot back a little far and it, if it was a broadhead, it probably wouldn't have clipped its lung, but mm-hmm. just because the cut diameter on that blade, when it opened up, it just sliced the back of both lungs. When I opened it up, it had two marks that basically look like you just cut enough of each lung to deflate it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it was, huh. it was insane. You know, so. that is like the most common scenario that guys point to. It's like if I was shooting a fixed blade, I wouldn't have killed it because I didn't have the forgivability of that cutting diameter that a mechanical offers. And that's like the number one thing I, I keep hearing. And, and bears are just kind of really pulley soft. And it just seems like mechanicals do better on bears than say an, like an elk. Um, I mean, I know guys that use mechanicals on elk, but I also know a lot of guys who don't because they, <laughs> they started with mechanicals. Yeah. And so uh, it just, it's just really interesting. Like I, I would use a mechanical on a bear, I think. Um, I'd probably use the severs cause that was the number one mechanical I've tested. I had a freaking rage bend on a Turkey and I'm like, this is no, I'm not using another rage. I've just, if, if, if that rage bent on a freaking Turkey, I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know about that. So it just, uh, but the, the severs, um, I just like the way that they're designed. If I was going to use a, a, a mechanical, it would probably be a sever. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And see, I was always dead against expandables always. Cause I was just told you had to use fixed broadheads. Cause that's what, you know, the guy, who, my cousin got me into archery. That's what he said. Nope. You got to use these. Yeah. That's what you got to use. And I, and I was like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm gonna give it away. <clears throat> and I did. And I, you know, I'm using them right now. Uh, I haven't been out that much, but uh, I'm going to give it a whirl. And like, you know, um, it, it might, I might regret it, you know, but I mean, the only thing I'm kind of hesitant about is you get a front shoulder or something just that's the only that's the only thing i would be worried about is if you know you just you get a front shoulder and it just right something happens but well i would feel pretty confident that i'd make it through with my fixed blade setup mm. and as sharp as i can get those things uh i i don't know what it would take to stop that that head i mean yeah. an elk shoulder would probably be a pretty good bet but um, it just, I feel like I can, it opens up shot angles when on a deer, when you're not worried about shoulder blades or anything. Mm-hmm. Cause, uh, I shot a bull last year <clears throat> and it was a 62. And I say this thinking, I thought I already had an arrow in it. I don't take 62 yard frontals on purpose. Um, but it was a 62 yard frontal cause I thought I already had an arrow in it. So I was just trying to get another arrow on the bull. And, uh, he was facing straight uphill at me, like ever so quartered to me. Mm -hmm. and um and i was going i was like it was steep and so i shot him and i went right where i was aiming i mean i was within an inch of where that pin was and it came out right in front of the back hip and just i don't even know i never found the arrow just zipped right through him Mm -hmm. and i'm just thinking my that's incredible a lot of guys don't get pass throughs at 20 yards on a frontal with an elk i just got one at 62 yeah and i'm like thinking and with a 480 grain arrow that's freaking crazy shooting 270 feet per second you know like I'm not shooting a, you know, Cameron Haynes setup or anything. I'm just shooting an average, probably super average setup for the average bow hunter out there, like 28 and a half inch draw, you know, just 70 pound, yeah. 70 pounds. Yeah. yeah 480 that, I, think, grain arrow. I think that's, de- you, yeah, that's definitely like the most common 28, 28 and a half, 70 pound is exactly. You know, and I'm like, if I can do that. And then the number one factor was I bought, I know what it was is I bought that KME um, sharpener mm-hmm. last year. And, um, cause I'd been shooting my, um, day six broadheads and they were all dull and I was like, God damn it. And I got to sharpen them and I wasn't getting them as sharp as I wanted. So I bought the KME and after hearing some other guys were liking it. And, um, I mean, I, I, I'm still missing hair right here. I just did it the other day <laughs> and, uh, everybody, I took out my broadheads. Everybody was like, Holy, this is the sharpest broadhead I've ever seen. And, and I, you're not even hearing the arrows hit. Yeah. It's just, it's so sharp there's really no, and there's almost no energy loss when you're entering the animal. It's I've noticed that that's one thing I've noticed last two years is, is, and it's pretty freaking obvious. And maybe I'm just slower than most, but the louder the arrow, when it hits, that's, that's energy loss. That's what you're hearing is energy loss. And when I started sharpening my own broadheads with the KME, it's, I don't know if I hit the animal unless I actually see the bud coming out how the animal reacted or if it just tips over. Cause I'm not hearing it hit anymore. Like 
I heard it hit broadside, but I smacked a rib um, broadside and never found that arrow either. And that was at 62 yeah. yards, same bowl. So yeah. uh, it just, I don't know what your experience is with that, but. Well, it's funny like that. Okay. So like I shot a mule deer, that mule deer I shot, it got in both lungs. When it hit, it sounded like you're hitting it with a paddle. Oh, with an expandable. Yeah. That yeah. was one, you know, it, hit, <laughs> right. it sounded like you're hitting it with an expandable. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, look at all these these Eastern Whitetail guys that are shooting things with their expandable. And every time they make a good shot, it sounds like they're hitting a two by four. It's just, yeah. it's just like, man, those hit hard. And and um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just weird. It it sharpness was one of the things that I always knew was important, but I underestimated how important yeah. it was. Yeah. So yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, fact. That, that that's one thing I I do like about uh, like you know I shot the Montex for the longest time and that's mm-hmm. one thing i just loved about them you could just take them out and frick you could sharpen those things on anything you know yeah. what i mean any stone frick, a piece of sandpaper really would get them sharp and that you know um that's one thing i really liked about those so we'll see I, like i said i'm using the expandables i'm going to use them for bear for um you know um go get two bear so i'll let you know if i have any issues with them or, or uh, yeah i love hearing the results of what people are getting and and um you know, bears are bears are tough because they don't produce great blood trails anyway. So might as well put that in your favor. Just trying to get a bigger exit and bigger entrance is is yeah. just to me. I mean, it just seems it, like a win. Yeah. And shot placements get big too. And you know, with those uh those rages, the shot placement is, you know, it's it's next to your field point pretty much. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough. What about uh for like uh rifle hunting? What kind of mm-hmm. setup you use for those you, 308s? You said you were using a 6.5? Yeah. Um, so uh, first time I ever shot a bear with a 6.5 will be the last time I ever shoot a bear with a 6.5. <laughs> <five. laughs> um, and, and granted, I've got some buddies here locally that are that are um, shooting bears with 6.5 and they're finding success mixed. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't know whether it was the cartridge or just shooting over, over exerting the 6.5 past its capabilities. But um, I was using that. Yeah, I have a Ruger precision rifle and a six, five, it's extremely accurate. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's, it's half M away all day long and it's, it's a straight up shooter and, um, shot that bear this year at 430 yards, um, hit it right where I wanted and which was a high shoulder. And that bullet basically just smacked the shoulder and stopped. And I was thinking I was going to bust right through both of them and, and just probably have to put a follow up shot on them, but he wouldn't mm-hmm. get away. And, um, and I now know that that's outside the capability of, of at least the uh, projectile that I was using. If I was using maybe like an SST uh, Hornady, which I've used a lot on animals, maybe I would have got through both shoulders. I don't know. It's my first time ever using a Sierra Match King. Probably be the last time I ever use a Sierra Match King just because I don't want to use a bolt that I had failure with. So mm-hmm. um, same reason I quit using um, my dad's hand load Acubons. They weren't expanding <laughs> at all. Right. And so... Um, the SSTs have been great. Long story short, um, missed a bear with the uh, with the gun because I I had my scope bases came loose early in the season, so I tightened them at home. Went up to go shoot, and where I was going to go shoot, there's a absolute stud of a bear there, and I'm like, shit, you know, like, well, it's it's mil spec base, so I'm like, it's probably it probably fell really close back in. I, I might be a few inches off, and so I figured if I could sneak in as close as I could, which was 325 yards. I could, I could make a good shot on the bear and it was like three feet to the left of the head. So it wasn't even close. I was like, well, that was really stupid of me to do that. Really irresponsible. Um, and so after beating myself up and how stupid I was about taking that shot, um, I sighted in and then I had that big bear I shot and, and, uh, my buddy found it five days later feeding. Um, so I know I didn't gut shoot him and, um, I, and he was dragging his right shoulder. So I know I smoked him right where I thought I did. It just didn't have the oomph to get him there. And um, the bear ended up getting shot again. And the guy made a bad shot. And the bear is now uh, missing uh, in action. We guess it wasn't a fatal shot. So we're guessing he's the poor thing still alive. Um, and so that was with a 308, though, what, the, what he used. Um, fast forward, I used a 300 um, Win Mag Sendero. Um, and I, with a vortex, uh, the new vortex razor gen yeah. three, yeah. um, which is freaking yeah, amazing by the way, nice it scope. is yeah. the yeah. nicest scope I've ever looked through. And, uh, first, first 
evening, I spent 60 rounds at the range, um, which is very expensive at 67 bucks a box. Um, I spent 60, 65 rounds doping my gun, getting used to the gun. Um, the first box, I decided to put a break on it. The second box, I decided to put a trigger in it. And then the next 40 rounds was, <laughs> were, you know, it was getting used to the gun and doping it. Uh-huh. And um, I was shooting, you know, uh, I would say under MOA at 800, um, right. right at MOA or just under MOA at 800. Um, I mean, the last bullet I left the range at was two inches from a bullseye at eight. And I was like, I think I'm good to go. And yeah. so the next evening I had a bear out in the unit napping and uh, 200, it was probably a 350 yard shot, but the cut was, it was super steep. I was shooting basically down a cliff. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't look that steep in the video, but it was freaking steep. And uh, so the, the range was 213. And, uh, that, that bear, I mean, he moved his head a little bit, but he, he never moved really. Um, yeah, I seen the video yet. You can see what you can see the bullet hit the bear, but yeah, it's funny. He just, he kind of just didn't do a lot. Yeah, no, he was done. And that I was using a, um, federal, um, brand with a, I don't even know how you pronounce it. Syriaco, Syriaco. Um, I don't even know what the bullet was, but it was a Sirocco something. And I got the go ahead for my long range, buddy. he's like, that's a badass round. Um, go ahead and send it. And, uh, so I did not bear. Um, yeah, that bullet did a lot of damage. Um, yeah. and I hit him basically right at the base of the neck and then out, oh, okay. um, through the, through the lungs into the, sh- like probably oh, okay. clipped the front of the lungs. And then just the way my season had gone, I, I didn't post it just cause it wasn't super PC, but um i I put another one in them just for shits and giggles yeah. just i insurance after oh, yeah I definitely um, yeah. yeah well it, it, hey there's nothing wrong with throwing an extra one i'd rather throw an extra one just for insurance than this one bear i shot <laughs> he's laid out like not quite laid out like a like a pillow on the side of a hill but he's kind of like laying on his side and i got i thought the bear was dead thought he was totally dead i got 10 feet from him the fucking bear turned around and got up and ran away oh I thought he was yeah. toast and he got up and he left. And then like right there, I never found that bear. He, I'm pretty sure he still lived, but I mean, yeah. I could have easily put another one in him easily. Yeah. And I, I believe did. it. And then I'm like, Oh fuck. Oh what yeah. Like, I mean, I had move. my pistol drawn. I mean, I put two kill shots in the bear, watched him for 10 minutes. He didn't flinch, still took a pistol down and was drawn on him. When I approached him, like I don't trust bears at all. Um, and I've, I've even had experiences where I shot a coyote, swear to God, true story. I shot a coyote at 850, the longest shot I've ever made on any animal ever. And um, it was with a seven mag. And the first shot, I didn't know there was any wind because we're shooting off Rimrock in Houston, Oregon. So I hit like yeah. I hit like four mils to the to the right. And and I was using a first focal plane scope. So all I did was like saw where the dust kicked up and then I moved my hash marks over to match, you know, where I missed. Yeah. And then the second shot hit him in the head, I, I think. Right. Um, Cause he immediately went on his back, tipped over legs straight up in the air. And I just like, Holy shit. I just made that shot and drilled him. And then my dad's like, good nice shot kid. And he's watching it. And then I'm like, wait, what? He got up and then booked it. Like <laughs> I knocked him out. I think is like, I must've skinned it off the top of, I don't oh, know. I don't yeah. know what happened, but yeah. I think I knocked him out or something. Cause he, we watched him run for, I don't know, a thousand yards. He was healthy. Yeah. And so it's just like, man, you never know what happened. Did you, never did you know. knock the animal out or, or whatever? And bears, um, maybe I'm a little chicken shit, but I, I don't trust them. And I always bring a gun. Even when I know they're dead, I always bring a gun Yeah, because they're, like I said, they're, they are a predator. They have teeth, they have claws and they're tougher than you are. And so it's just yeah. safety. It's yeah, safety. that goes for any animal. I mean, uh, I've had bad experiences with deer that I thought were dead and gone up to them and they weren't and they've had charged me it's funny a long time ago me and my old man are hunting we're hunting moose and uh we see a moose they're running up a tree line and i was and they just sit inside the tree line and i was like okay listen i'm gonna go hike around and i'm gonna flush them out to you worked perfectly flush the two out the bull stopped turn around look at him 60 yards away he shot bull went down i was like <laughs> nice headshot <laughs> headshot he's down he's done he starts walking towards it it gets up runs not quite towards him but like he, he was checking his shorts after that thing was that's you know what i mean <laughs> like, yeah he got up and ran away 
And yeah. we found a little bit of like antler and a tiny little bit of blood. We figure he, he maybe he hit the antler and knocked it out. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think that happens and you know, like, like you ever get the wind knocked out of you and you just pass out. Yeah. I think that happens to animals too. Cause yeah. I, the, there's been other scenarios and, and you even see, we had a guy even get, he got killed by a bull elk, um, a couple years ago in Oregon, an old guy stuck in the elk, wounded it, went back the next day to find it, walked up on it and it gored him, um, in the neck oh. and he bled out. And, um, and I'm like, that's some crazy shit. <laughs> Yeah. And then we had a guy many years ago, he either died or got severely messed up helping a buddy go track a black bear uh, near where I live, didn't take a gun with him. And well, the guy with the, without the gun found the bear first and the bear went on him and attacked him. And, and I, I forget whether it killed him or, or just maimed him, but it, it really was like, you know, that's, I just, all those thoughts. And then we see some of the guys that are approaching these whitetails and then the, the whitetails go him. Um, and then you see all the head lacerations they have. It's just like, it just, I don't know. It just seems, no, it just makes sense to me to bring a gun with you when you go check yeah. an animal that you don't know is sure until you poke it and gut it, you know? Yeah. I don't know. You never know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, like I, I brought my three weight with me cause that Sendero is like, it's gotta be 15 or 17 pounds. It's heavy. Um, it's a landing gun. And so I brought my 308 with me and, um, and like, it was like 10 feet visibility on that bear the other night, last night. And, uh, I was like, thank God I have a gun, you know, and I mm -hmm. gave my hunting partner, my pistols, like, and they weren't, they weren't, they weren't going to bring one. And right. it's like, no, you, you are going to bring a gun. I, I bring two or three guns with me when I go bear hunting, because if I have to have help retrieving a bear, I'm going to have a gun for every person that shows up, whether right. they want, right. want it yeah. or not. So, um, it's for me, it's just a safety issue. Yeah. I don't do that for elk, even though this year I could have used, we didn't have a pistol this year when I retrieved my elk. And we got charged by a cougar, um, oh, yeah. who, who had claimed my bowl. Right. And that was crazy. And then, so after that, my wife's like, you have a, like, go, go ahead and buy a pistol. Like you have yeah. a total pass. And so yeah. I still haven't, I've been stealing hers, but, um, <laughs> it's just, you know, stuff like that happens. Yeah. And when you have way too many predators, like we do in Oregon, it happens more often than not. Yeah. And, uh, not more often than not, but it happens more frequently than it should. Yeah. And, um, it's just, I don't know, man, it's just, I don't know how we got on that subject, but it just, that stuff happens. And it, oh, I yeah. just, maybe I, maybe I feel like I, I need to defend my man card because I'm not willing to go check on an animal without a gun, but, um, no man, that, but it, it happens. And the thing is, the more you do it, the more likely it's going to happen if it hasn't happened already. So it's better mm -hmm. to be prepared than, than to be sorry for sure. I agree hundred yeah. percent. And, yeah. uh, even when we went on some hunts, um, I've only been on uh, one truly guided hunt and that was in Africa and they wouldn't let us approach uh, a gems buck that my wife killed. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, why? And he's like, cause they are straight up dangerous when they're wounded and we don't know if he's dead yet. Right. And, um, and so they will gore you. He's like, they will gore you. And I'm like, okay. So they had to give us the, the go ahead to go up and retrieve the animal before they, you know, it was just interesting. So they, they take it the guy that we were with took safety very serious. We went yeah. when it came to certain animals. And yeah. so that's good though. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I find, um, this year, my son, he, he just got his core. And so, you know, I do a lot of things that I probably shouldn't do. And I got, a, you know, it's funny when I'm with him, I, I'm definitely a little more cognizant of, of what I'm doing and uh, you know, yeah, for sure. And, and like up in Canada, we're not allowed to have handguns. So, um, really, yeah, we can. I mean, you can have, you can go and get what's called your restricted firearms license, but you have to basically let the, you have to notify the RCMP when you're transporting it and it can only what? be done at like a range. Yeah. You can't have one in the back country. Can't be what? Concealed. Yeah. That's bullshit. Yeah. You, you guys know, have yeah. grizzly bears. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck man. We got everything. We got polar bears. Like some place in Canada, yeah. you're going to come across everything. Right. So Holy yeah, crap. that's our, that's our uh, our government for you, and they're just. I did not know that. I had yeah. no idea. Yeah. Oh, the dude, and they're taking away guns. Every like, it seems like every month there's a new gun law coming into effect. So I mean, all the more reason I guess to keep shooting my bow, but yeah. it might not even be a lot of firearm up here, and not that you can really get any ammo for them anyway up here. But um, that sucks, dude. I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah. yeah. That's hardcore. Well, with what's going on in America right now, we might be heading that way too. So, yeah, 
Yeah, it's it's a weird time, that's for sure. Yeah, but uh, bear spray, that's what we're allowed to have, bear spray. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So if you got an 800-pound brown bear chasing you, you can take your bear spray out. And you you piss it off before it kills you. <laughs> you spray it on yourself, right? So you season it, season yourself up. Oh, yeah, there it. you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my luck, I'd spray myself and then I'd run into a tree or something. But yeah, hopefully, yeah, you knock I, uh, yourself out while he's chewing on you. That's crazy. That's that's insanity. I can't believe that. I had no idea, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of funky stuff up here, brother. Cool, dude. But you know what? I think I've uh, I've held you up long enough. Why don't you uh, you plug what you got going on there? And let us know about your YouTube, your Instagram handle, and uh, and your podcast. Yeah, so um, we're actually right now. Uh, we have the first. I have my first ever hunt giveaway going on um nice. really excited about it. i've been wanting to do it for years um finally found a vehicle to get it done and it's called hunt league and i partnered up with hunt league and um jared the owner is super cool he's kind of given me the reins to just go for it and he's created the whole league and everything and really done a great job with it he's even gone out and found all the sponsors for it so we've got first light vortex um, EXO just came on board. Uh, there's, there's going to be close to, um, they're, I think they're valuing, valuing the bear hunt at like $3,500 is how much they're, you know, if you're going to go out and buy it here locally, I think that's what it would cost you. Um, so that is the prize package for the bear hunt, but all the prizes involved are going to equal close to 10 to 12,000 in prizes on top of the bear hunt. So there's going to be over 10 grand in prizes um and uh so like an exo pack and a bunch of other cool stuff cool um really excited about that the odds of winning are actually really good we have less than 50 um basically people competing currently oh, um it the competition ends next uh i think june and then we're going to choose a winner <clears throat> and we're going to fly them out all exclusive um or all expenses paid uh trip to go hunt with me for i think five days Bear Hunter Magazine is involved. They're a sponsor. They're going to go oh, there. Yeah. They're going to film it. They're going to upload it onto their YouTube channel of 70,000 plus subscribers. They're going to have an article front page, I believe, if we can take a good photo. Um, they're going to have a headline article in the magazine. And then um, Vortex is going to send a rep down. They're going to hunt with us um, after we take care of the winner. And uh, it's going to be a really cool experience. And we're calling it the On Point Experience, not the On Point Bear Hunt, because if the winner wants to they can shoot two bears right. um however if they wanted to because we have a lot of really cool stuff where i live we have crater lake we have the north Elm Quaw, which is a beautiful fly fishing river um we have a bunch of really cool things so if they shot a bear and wanted to go have me take them fly fishing we have great fantastic fly fishing up the north Elm Quaw for big ass trout um and uh we have a bunch of other stuff we can go do it's just whatever the winner wants to do my goal is to make sure they have a filled bear tag at the end of it. And then the best experience they can, I want them to fall in love with where I live and with bear hunting. Um, and that's the main goal there. So, um, I think it costs $15 to join the app. The league itself is free. And, um, all you have to do is basically log your hunts like a diary, just an elect electronic diary. Um, it's not a big buck or a big bowl competition. I wouldn't be a part of it or have it had it structured that way. If it was, it's literally just keeping track of what you do. And, um, and just, uh, yeah, just basically having an electronic online diary. So cool. is it open to, uh, to everyone? Can Canadians I, take part? I, you know? I wish it was open to Canadians. I, I don't <laughs> think it is. Um, Bro. and there's a couple States that are even prevent us from doing it too. Oh, okay. So, um, but it, it's, uh, yeah, I don't believe it's open to Canada, but, um, like I said, your odds are really good at winning. If you started, whenever um if you started next october like this october mm -hmm. you would still have a great chance at winning it's if you if if you start late we're still going to keep you know keep you in the race yeah. um just to make sure that people can enter late and still have a chance at winning so um cool. it's not a killing competition make that very clear not a big bucker bowl competition um mentorship conservation um community engagement these are all things i'm looking for you know yeah. what did you do to help out the community did you mentor anybody did you, you know, tell me why you deserve to go on a free bear hunt basically? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's really what I'm excited about. So, um, cool, yeah. And outside of that, um, that's, that's my main focus really. Honestly, I'm having Jared over, uh, in August of this, this year, uh, we're going to do a test run on, on the bear hunt giveaway with his son. 
he's bringing his son along and we're going to just basically do a practice practice run and we're going to try and get his son a bear. So cool. Um, it's, it's my favorite two weeks of the year to hunt bears is the first two weeks of August here. And, um, and like we have locally, the born and raised guys are, are local to me and where they hunt, they saw over a hundred bears, um, this spring already. Wow. So we have them with are thick around here. We have about 30,000 bears in Oregon approximately. Wow. And, uh, we have way too many. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it'd be, it will be a great time. And, and if anybody wants to enter, I highly encourage it. So cool. I make zero dollars cool. off of it. It's it's just a it's just a tr- mentorship and and just trying to get people involved and and uh, and get out and get in the woods and, and enjoy. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And the podcast too on point. Yeah, it's on point with Garrett Weaver. Um, <clears throat> and then the YouTube channel is on point with Garrett Weaver. I think I have a, a, over two hundred videos on YouTube now. Um, and most of it is bow hunting tips, tricks, tactics, a lot of tuning and broadhead reviews and yeah. bow review, a lot of bow reviews, but a lot of, a lot of just things that I do to get ready for bow hunting and, and tips on shooting and stuff like that cool. and ideas to practice. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I appreciate you having me on, man. And, and, yeah, um, it's been awesome. yeah, hope- we're a little behind you guys, you know, in our tree starting to really take off up here, trying to really get that out and, and let guys know about that. And it's hard, it's a hard thing to get into if, you know, if you don't have anyone helping you out along the way, luckily I did. Uh, so I try to, you know, encourage and help out other people as well. But I mean, it's pretty intimidating to get out by yourself, even just to shoot a bow. Yeah. You know, if you never, if you don't have anyone teaching you, you know, like I've, I've taken guys who never shot a bow before and, and they're like, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa what are you doing? Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I don't even remember what it was like the first time. Cause I had someone there just be like, no, this is how you do it. Put this here, nose on the string. Blah, yeah. blah, 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 right? Anchor, set, hand, grip, all that stuff. It was just, you know, second nature to me. And then you see these other guys and you're like, holy Christ, man, really? Like, okay, back up. Yeah. Uh, don't let you go that way. Because you, yeah. you, you know everything. And and I had a different experience when I started. I had no one. I had no one. I had to learn it all. Right. Trial and error, man. And yeah. uh, and I love bow hunting so much. I'm like, I I respect the grind. I love the grind. But if I can help somebody not have to go through that shit, because yeah. it was, it was not, it was fun. It was a lot of fun learning all the things the hard way, but man, it, it also would have been nice to have somebody yeah. show me some of these yeah. things. And, yeah. And, you know, um, I, I know we, uh, we're going to sign off here, but just, if we could just go on that for one quick minute. Yeah. For the guys listening who are in the situation that you're in, what kind of, what are some tips that you'd give them for just, you know, getting through those and overcoming all that stuff? Um, there's a lot of information now. There wasn't podcasts when I started, there wasn't a bunch of YouTube channels teaching you how to do all this stuff. I had to go out and, and just learn through thousands and thousands and thousands of arrows and it's okay to fail. It's okay to, to not hit what you're shooting at target wise. Um, you know, have those failures in the, in, in, in the range, not in the field. Um, and that's kind of been my motto is, is if I can eliminate all my mistakes, before I even get into the field and I know where my points of failure are, I'll be more successful when I get those really hard opportunities that are hard to earn when you bow, when you bow hunt sometimes. Right. And, and so, um, podcasts like yours, um, podcasts like mine, YouTube channels, there's so much information yeah. that there's really no excuse to, to not learn really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, it, my buddy, who's not very t- technically anything when it comes to bow hunting, he said a really profound statement for me. And he's like, and, and it stuck with me. And he said, um, it was something to the effect of like, you spend the least amount of time getting good at archery. It doesn't take very long to get good, to be able to hit a playing card at 40 yards. It doesn't take that long. You spend, you spend most of your time getting really good. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay. So, and that, to me, that was really, that was really a profound statement because that's so true. It doesn't take very long to get good. You can hit a playing card with a bow after a week at 40 yards, you can hit a you should be able to hit it almost every shot at 20 yards for sure. And, um, so you can get good really quick, but you're going to spend, you know, the majority of your time fine tuning, getting rid of these small little airs and, um, and getting really good with your bow. And and that's just part of the process. The, The number one thing I would say hindsight, if I could start over is learn to shoot with a shooting process, have a process. Um, the most valuable thing anybody can learn right now is the, uh, shot IQ, Joel Turner. I don't know if you know who that is. Um, that guy, in my opinion is the single most valuable gem 
um, in shooting sports period, whether it be with a rifle, um, a shotgun, a slingshot, a bow, it doesn't matter what Mm -hmm. he's teaching people is refining the way that people are shooting and the results speak for themselves. Um, I was doing what he was saying prior to knowing about it, but I didn't understand any of it or why. And after talking to him and listening to him and then really learning about his mantra and and his, where he basically what he teaches, um, it just was basically just connected a few dots for me and it made me a better shooter Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but before he did a podcast with me, he went back and watched a bunch of my old, um, YouTube videos and basically, and then went you know, kind of just watched some of my newer stuff. He's like, where'd you learn to shoot? And I was like, well, I had the triple crown, you know, um, Archer teach me a couple of years ago. Cause I was shooting eyes. I was cocky, you know? Right. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, I was a good shot. I was much better than average, but still I kept telling him like, I have my off days, you know, I have my days where every arrow at 80 yards is in a chew can, you know, three out of four, at least are in a chew can at 80 yards. And then the yeah. next one's like two inches out. And then th- the next day I can't hit a basketball at 80 yards. What's yeah. going on? And he's like, well, it's cause you're shooting with target panic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I was like, no. And then, so that is what started my thought process. That was about two years before I ran into Joel. And, um, and then once Joel started teaching what he was doing with the, um, subconscious of shooting, uh, changed my perspective on target panic, blind bailing, all this stuff that you hear. Um, you, you got, you, you, it's just, it should be mandatory. You have to listen yeah. to shot IQ. It is that important. Um, learn how to shoot a good shot process and figure out what works best for you. Accuracy mm-hmm. is what I, def- I define accuracy as consistency and duplication. Can you consistently duplicate the same thing over and over and over again? Yeah. If you're doing the wrong shit over and over again, but you're doing it the same, that's still going to be accurate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's still going to be accurate, but there's going to be things that you can do to make you accurate, more accurate. And the the thing that I would tell people as well, I'm getting a little long with it. I apologize. Um, You get me on my soapbox here. Um, The thing that I would tell people is, is, is if you look at shooting like a running track, you're going to have eight lanes in it or however many lanes in it. Mm -hmm. And that is the foundational principles to shooting a bow pick your lane just because you're not shooting like this guy's telling you to telling you to do he, as long as he's on the track and he's doing these foundational right. principles, you guys are both doing the right thing. Tim Gillingham shoots a finger release quite often index release, right? Mm-hmm. He also shoots other things too, but most 90% of shooters that are that level are shooting hinges or back tensions. Mm-hmm. Is he wrong? No. Cause he's smoking a lot of guys at the range. Yeah. Um, and, and it just, there's a lot of different things to do out there. There's a million ways to shoot a hinge. There's a million ways to shoot, an index release. You got to find out works what works best for you, but figure out the foundational principles. And like I said, listen to Joel. Yeah. So. Yeah. That No, that's a good point. And that's just it. You know, you don't set standards of what other guys are doing. Um, you know, just set them for yourself. Cool. Yeah. And it's funny. You talked about shooting a, you know, a card up to 40 yards and you could be a good archer, but being a good archer and being a good bow hunter, two completely different (laughs) things but uh i'm gonna end it there because you and i are gonna get going down that rabbit hole and we'll save that for another podcast okay buddy thanks a lot eh? all right man i appreciate it kevin later see ya thanks again everyone for tuning in to the focus hunting podcast it's coming at you as part of the waypoint outdoor collective quick shout out to the sponsors of the show vortex optics the best in optics period backroads maps books never get lost with backroads maps AKU boots, yo to your feet. Scree hunting gear. Now, if you guys check the show notes, you're going to find some promo codes. Use them, save a bit. Love you guys. Talk to you soon.